first lesson comes from the book of Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 6, the potter and the clay. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Says the Lord, Just like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter, verses 25 through 27. The cost of discipleship. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife and children, brother, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life, life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Good morning. So, I shared with all, with all of you last week that this would be a continuation, a uh, part two sermon, um, and it's... Um, I had a lot to say last week and didn't have a lot of time to say it. And so my mentor once told me years ago, did you say everything you wanted to, Barry? And I said, no. He says, well, you plan on preaching again? I said, yes. He says, then don't try to get it all in in one. And I'm not going to do that to you either. We're going to continue this series again next week. Um, so I'm basically going to, because there's some people here that weren't here last week, I need to fill you in on what we're talking about. A couple years back, I went to San Antonio, Texas to a preaching, concert, uh, a pre uh, preaching conference and there was this man there, Walter Brueggemann, who's a very uh, fa famous theologian. And he gave us uh, pastors a, um, a lecture. Not, not just a lecture on learning, but like a lecture like we were in trouble, right? And he said, pastors, one of the reasons why the church is, is not um, doing very well right now, uh, being uh, something relevant in people's lives, is because we're not telling people the truth. And he said, the reason why we're not telling the truth is because we're afraid to tell the truth. So last week I was sharing with you the testimony that I went to visit my son's school, Noah, who's starting his freshman year. And as I was walking around, and I apologize to you guys here last week, I know I, I said this already, but just to get us caught up into to where we are. When I was walking around the school, checking out his classrooms and going from um, room to room, um, I kept thinking to myself, how would my son be able to get out of this room if there was an active shooter? I shared with you that uh, the memory of when I went to high school and all the different fears I had, and I invited you to remember back when you went to school and perhaps some of those fears that you had, and I you know, shared with you that all the different fears I had, that was not one of them. And so the pastor always teeters with, oh, is he trying to be political on this side or is he trying to be political on that side? And so the pastor says, um, Walter Brueggemann's wrong. I don't need to be courageous. I can just avoid this topic altogether and just tell everybody how, how, how wonderful we are and there's no problems. But that wouldn't be telling you the truth, now would it? We have the good news. We have the gospel. And we see, if you see that, uh, that lesson today in Luke, Jesus is, that was Jesus who said that? That doesn't sound like Jesus. See, there's, there's, this, there's this message that we have to stop and examine, that sometimes, most of the time, isn't easy. But things that aren't easy that we strive for, aren't those the things that are most worthwhile? We're going to be talking about this particular issue of violence in this nation and how if we see ourselves as a, as a nation that has been blessed by God, are we being good stewards of, of his land, of his creation? We have responsibility, not only to receive of love and grace and salvation, but to be active participants of that gift 
today. Now, I want to share a story with you that I had uh, three years ago when I was at CCRI in, um, in um, a logic class. And we had to create, in this logic class, we had to create a, some, a debate, a debate. And all these different students were coming up with different ideas on what they could debate. And I, I met with the professor. I really, um, I really admire this professor, and I, I enjoyed a conversation with him. His name is Dr. Browning. And I said to him, I, I, have, a, I have a different topic I want to do. And he says, what's your topic? I said, I want to have, have a debate on why we should be able uh, why we should be able to have conversation about gun control. Or, rather, the problems of guns. I said, why don't we do that? Instead of talking about, because everybody's about gun control and the Second Amendment rights back and forth and the politicians stop fighting, I said, why don't we just have a conversation about the problems with gun violence? He said, that's an interesting conversation. I said, I propose to you that people in this class are not willing to even have the conversation that there is a problem with gun violence. And he said, well, let's try it. So I set up this experiment, and sure enough, I said, here's my debate. We are unable to have a conversation about the problem of violence in this country regarding guns. And I showed some statistics. And all of a sudden, a student raised a hand and, sh and shot out, those statistics aren't accurate because half of those people on there were suicides. I'm like, isn't that worthy of conversation? Isn't it? Have you heard this argument before? I said, he said, but that's, that's, not, I, that's not part of the problem. I'm like, that, that, there's something that we should examine. Why can't we examine that? Because it's irrelevant. And then I went on to the next topic. And I showed how in our nation, that when we realized that there was violence being, and deaths caused from, you heard this one if you're on Facebook, automobile accidents. Why don't we ban all cars, people will say. And I said in this debate, I said, we realized it was a problem, and what did we do? I remember when they added the third brake light, do you? Do you remember sitting on your father's or uh, mother's lap driving when you were a kid? <laughs> do we still do that? Do you remember being in a car seat? I don't. We had seatbelt regulations. We have safety regulations. We did things, and people say, well, people still die, but we tried to do something better. I put came to you that in this debate, in this, in this conversation I'm having with you today, instead of looking at the situation on what we cannot do, why don't we start at what we can do? And then somebody will call me, maybe, I don't know, a pinko communist or a socialist, I don't know, call me whatever you like, but I'm not a politician, I'm your pastor, and I have a responsibility to you. I have responsibility to the Lord, I have responsibility to myself and to my family to say that there's an elephant in the room. And this glorious nation that we declared has been blessed by God is not acting so holy. Now, as I shared with you also in philosophy, we love to soak in the question, and very seldom do we have any answers, right? Today, as a continuation of last week's message, I'm inviting us to soak in the question, and not being, not being limited on what we can't do, but rather saying what we can do. So in order to continue this, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with last week's scripture reading, and I'm going to go through it very quickly. Because in this scripture reading, which is still in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was speaking about how people were following the law, but not for righteous sake. They were using the law to oppress. Do we see that in our nation today? Are we willing to look at that today? Okay, stay with me here. I know I'm kind of going on, topic, going on a big topic here. But this is his continuation of last year. It says, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in the land of the desert and pits, in the land of drought and deep darkness? We have been delivered. No different than those that were wandering in the desert place. They have been delivered to the promised land. We proclaim that this is the promised land, but yet it looks a lot like a desert place filled with pits. We have responsibility as Christians to be good stewards of God's creation. In this land, no one passes through where no one lives. I brought you into the plentiful land to eat fruit and of good things. And what have we done because of these good things? I believe we become lazy. We become complacent, just waiting for God to continue to provide, not realizing that we have a responsibility to be yoked with God in creation. 
For it says, for when you entered, you defiled my land. You made my heritage an abomination. I fear that's what we're doing today. Just trying to be honest with myself and be honest with you. We love to say, God bless America and how great we are. But if we want to maintain our greatness, then we have to take some inventory. Just like our confession of sin, it's not to beat us down, but it's to recognize that there's areas in our lives that need to be straightened out. And only when we recognize that through our confession can we move forward and grow. God's not done with us yet. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who hand, handled the law did not know me. This is a constant problem with Jesus, wasn't it? Why are you healing somebody on the Sabbath? Why are you, why are you feeding people on the Sabbath? Always using the law against grace, against mercy. Now this brings me into something I'm working on right now. I'm in, I, I shared with you last week, and I'll share with you again now. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a teacher assistant in an ethics class. And being so, I get to read all my fun books and, and uh, get prepared. And when I was reading, I, was, I found some great stuff I want to share with you. But first, I found this on Facebook. And this is a problem that we have with regarding the law. Legally permissible is not morally correct. I did a social experiment yesterday on Facebook. I do that. Hope you don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being conniving or anything. But I put in a, an experiment on what, how people would respond to the topic, should felons be able to vote? And I wasn't disappointed because people came back like that with an answer. Just like that. I mean, and I loved it because I'm like, you guys, everyone missed the point. Everyone missed the point. Everyone's got an answer, but not one person had a question. Not one question. Quickly, I bet you all of you had an answer in your mind, right? And I, because I, this is what philosophers do. We, we like to pretend we're all smart, right? We do this, we think. Hmm. And that's what I did with this question was presented to me. And I thought all these different things and all these different ideas and what would happen if this and that. And instead, everybody gave their opinion and it was passionate. It was quick and passionate. And I realized that this is the problem. Like, we have too many darn answers. Right? We have too many limitations because of that, rather than just soaking in the problem. For crying out loud, we won't even admit there's a problem. So last week I gave a little experiment with you guys. I wanted you to soak on the idea, what does it mean, uh, cruelty versus um, kindness? Okay. Maybe I'm jumping ahead too fast. Let me just give you a little bit more about the law here. In Jesus' time, they said, you're trying to abolish the law, the law of God. And Jesus says, I I'm not trying to abolish anything. I'm trying to show you how the law was meant to be applied. Are our laws meant to liberate? Or are our laws meant to oppress? That's the thought I wanted to bring with that photo. Cruelty versus kindness. Cruelty. Think of something cruel. Think of something horrific. In the book I'm reading, can you imagine, can you maybe guess what the ultimate cruelty in this one book I'm reading of recent times that has happened within the last hundred years? Yep. The Holocaust, you got it. The Holocaust, the go-to, right? <laughs> um, does anyone, no, don't raise your hand because it's a setup. You're going you're gonna to feel embarrassed out, no? <laughs> cruelty is kindness the opposite of cruelty. Now, my gut instinct was yes. My gut instinct is yes, right? Because I'm always, pre I'm always proclaiming the good news here. Like, it was just, uh, the week I sh just last week, I was saying, you know, we've got to go out. We've got to be acts of kindness, right? We want to be a message of hope. And that's true. Amen? Hey, I mean, that's what we're called to do. We're called to do acts of kindness upon people. But is acts of kindness the opposite of cruelty? Let me share what Frederick Douglass said on it. But the kindness of the slave master only gilded the chains. It distracted nothing from its weight or strength. He's saying that we sometimes use the acts of kindness as a way to only clear our consciousness. It's a way for us, right? It's a way for us to look over the atrocities that we're doing. 
The opposite of cruelty is not kindness. The opposite of institution, institutionalized cruelty is freedom from the cruel relationship. This is from Hale. Do you see that? So, does this give us an opportunity for kindness? You follow me? Do you see what Frederick Douglass is saying? If we're oppressing people and we're being kind to those that are oppressed, we're just letting the social norms maintain the same. We're, we're patting ourselves on the back. We're, we're making ourselves feel good and, and putting blinders on the real issue. So what I put on that post just to share with you about should felons vote, I'm like, well, the problem is if you get caught doing crack cocaine, you just committed a felon. If you, got, if you got convicted using the white powder, the rich man's drug, cocaine, well, that's just a misdemeanor. My point is, the answer is not simple. The point is, are our laws just, and are we being just within them? The opposite of cruelty is the freedom from that unbalanced power relationship. Jesus Christ came to liberate who did he come to liberate? Was it the church? Was it the, was it the, pious, was it the pious priests? Was it the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Who did Jesus come to liberate? Who? The common? The what? Oppressed. Oppressed? Who? Somebody else? Everybody. Everybody. The blind? the hungry, the lame. He came to everyone. But the hardest he was on were those that were in places of power who was putting down everyone else. Now, it's a good Sunday message to say Jesus came to liberate us, but when we try to apply it in our nation, how do we do that? You say, Pastor, you know, that's fine. I see your point. I see what you're trying to make, but how do we apply that? How do we apply that in our world? You say, I don't know. But if we maybe if we recognize that the things that we are doing are only sugarcoating certain things, then we're forgetting that maybe we're part of the problem and not part of the solution. Why are we allowing laws to justify morality? Now, I'm not saying we don't have, shouldn't have laws. I'm not, I'm not proclaiming that. But I'm saying just because there is a law does not mean that it's a just law. Okay, well, Barry, you kind of went all over the place. You know, you started with guns, and now you're talking about something about felons voting. I'm not sure what that's about. Now, um, now you're saying we shouldn't have laws, we should have laws, and, and you guys are all have a lot of questions, right? And I say good. Good. Because I gave you a lot to think about. What, where are we as a nation? Okay, cruelty versus kindness. There is an exception to when cruelty... And, kind, and kindness is the opposite of cruelty. And that is when the kindness is being given in an act of liberation. So during the Holocaust, in France, there was this, there was this community that gave acts of kindness to fleeing Jews. Okay? They were helping them be liberated. That is the kind of act of kindness, right, that we are called to as Christians. It's not an easy one, though, is it? Let me give you another example. Acts of kindness, right? We give to Johnny Cake food, right? That's an act of kindness. But are we liberating those who are trying to receive of that food? You see what I'm saying here? There's a difference, isn't there? Right? We have social programs. I mean, this literally is that message. Do we give to someone a fish or do we teach them the fish? And where is our intent and our heart in this? I shared with you before about doing mission. My, I, I had this professor share with me in seminary. He says, I always imagine when we send shoes overseas and there's this young man opening up a box and there's a pair of Nike sneakers and he's saying to myself, I've been working on these 12 hours today in a sweatshop. That's an act of kindness, but is, but is that liberation? How do you, or, or here's this message, right? We, we like to dig wells in Africa, right? In different areas in Africa. And we send over our, our well digging crews. And you say the guy who, the local guy who does wells for a living and says, thanks a lot for this. Because he just lost the job. 
You see, there's a difference between acts of kindness and acts of liberation kindness. I proclaim to you that we are called as the church to be liberators. Just as Jesus has liberated us, has liberated me from myself. I don't know about you guys, but for me, the primary reason I am a follower of Jesus Christ is because I need to be liberated. And I see that in my, when I feel liberation, I, I, I get a, a desire in my heart to go forth and, and, and maybe be part of that message, liberating others. So this is a huge message, right? As I started off with this fear of my child going to school and the violence that we hear, I say we need to be liberated from that. And this liberation is more, than, is more complex than just setting up metal detectors. We need to go deeper. We need to go deeper into the human psyche and the human soul and kindness and love. The act of kindness to liberate. How do we do that? Well, Jeremiah in today's scripture reading tells us that. But first we have to recognize that if we are the clay and Christ and God is molding us, shaping us, we have to surrender to the potter. Our God puts his hands on us, right, and molds us and says, I have this beautiful vessel I want to make. And you're like, I just want to be an ashtray. The clay is telling the potter what we should be, who we should be, when in reality the potter has such a more beautiful Beautiful image to form us in. Are you guys with me on this, or am I losing you here? Then the word of the Lord came to him. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as the potter has done? The potter wants to form us into something so much more. Right? We're this clay, and, it's so, and, and God says we're so good, and, and, and I love you. But, but I have so much more for you. And that's not just individual, it's us as a nation, but in order for us, the nation, to grow in this beautiful form, it starts with us. And in order for it to start with us, we have to recognize that it's God's will, not our will. Now, here's where it gets tough. This is the Janu message. My, my mentor, uh, Reverend Janu. I would say to him when I was in the candidacy, just like Michelle, I say, man, I'm reading the Bible, and this is tough. He says, where did it ever say in the Bible it'd be easy? It said it'd be glorious. It said it'd be magnificent. But never does it say it will be easy. This message, right, I spent a lot of time soaking in this, in this question, and I don't even begin to proclaim to you that I have the answers to it. But I have a couple of suggestions. Now the, Lord, now the large crowd was traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. And people say, Amen. I get that all the time on Facebook. I haven't talked to my brother in 10 years. I haven't talked to my sister in 20 years. I, my mother, I want nothing to do with my father. I nothing. That's not, I don't think, what's going on here. This isn't justifying our broken relationships. I think there's something much more profound going on. And I say to you, it's, <laughs> I'm going to not say it's just twofold, but I'm going to give you a couple. First of all, Luke is speaking to the church, a church that is in turmoil. Yes, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. My mother is more than just my mother here. It's also you, Linda, right? right? Chris, my father, right? My brother. We're in this together, and there's going to be turmoil, and sometimes we're going to have to go against each other. The bigger message is there's going to be division. There's going to be division because we're in the world. And when we have the heavenly realm and the worldly realm, well, they are going to clash. If we try to bend, men, mesh them together, then there's a problem. Because God has something so much more in store for us than what this world can give us. As uh, Eugene Peterson shared, uh, shared a clip um, about a month ago where he was sharing that if you desire the ways of the earth... If you desire the heavenly realm, you can achieve it so much more. I'm paraphrasing. But if you desire the worldly realm, you will lose it. Eventually, you will lose it. If you desire just the ways of the earth, it will always eventually let us down. There's going to be division. How do we handle that division? Right? Well, I could give a nasty post on Facebook. I could... I could block Bob on Facebook. You're not on Facebook, but I could block you anyway. <laughs> I 
The message of hope here is, it's not supposed to be easy, but it's possible. But the problem is, so many problems, right? The problem is, we're too quick working a solution without soaking in it. Okay? Now, I got all riled up. I was told by a preaching uh, pastor, uh, uh, instructor once, he says, Barry, you're real passionate, but sometimes it comes across that you're angry. You don't want your congregation to think you're angry at them, and I don't want you to think I'm angry at you. But I am angry at the situation we're in. And our Lord and Savior says, we are good to be angry. We need a little bit more anger, but how do we direct that anger, right? In discipline, in grace, in liberation acts of kindness. So where do we begin? Well, we begin, we always begin in prayer, right? But don't ever let that stop us. For prayer is to, is to call us forward, to motivate us, to activate us, right? To do something. You know, there's a message, I forgot to put the slide in, it's a big thing in the politics right now, thoughts and prayers, and, you know, thoughts and prayers, and it's like, well, I want more than thoughts and prayers. Well, here's something about thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers are magnificent, because if you are in my thought, if you are in my prayers, truly, I'm saying, I'm not talking about just like, yeah, yeah, I'm saying, if you are truly in my prayers and thoughts, and I am motivated to pray to the Lord God, creator of the universe for you, then I have news for you guys. Nothing is going to stop me from being motivated in that thought and prayer because God's, I'm, when I, that prayer is, is coming back, right? It's not just, hey, God, you take care of this. Say, God, how can I be part of this? If I truly pray for you, if I truly think of you, and I truly, truly care for you, then how can I remain idle? I put on my full Christian armament, and I yoke myself with Christ. And even though it seems daunting, even though it seems impossible, I go out. Right, Michelle? Yeah. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Okay. I gave you two weeks of a lot of questions. I gave you so much stuff. I'm all over the place. I'm hoping that you sort it out. And not this kind of sort out. Okay, so Barry said this, and I think, um, I think Valen, uh, Felon shouldn't vote. No, no, no. Soak in the question. Next week, we're going to present some ideas on where we start. Right? We start with prayers, but where can we start with our action? How do we appropriately handle these situations? I propose to you, I go right back to where my sermon started. We take some inventory. What's changed when I was a child to what's going on today? Right? Instead of putting band-aids on situation, more, more police offices in schools, more um, checkpoints, metal detectors. Maybe we take a look at the human condition and how we can be an act of love and grace to the individual. That's speaking to you, Chris, yeah? Yeah, right? How do we care for the individual? So I got a guy who can help us on this. When in doubt, always turn to Fred. Who's made a difference in your life? Oh, a lot of people. But a lot of people who have allowed me to have some silence, and I don't think we give that gift very much anymore. I'm very concerned that our society is much more interested in information than wonder, in noise rather than silence. How do we do that? I mean, it, in our business, yours and mine, how do we encourage reflection? I trust that this book will do some of that, but oh my, this is a noisy world. And you guys are saying, and oh my, we have a very noisy pastor, and I wish just once he would give us the gift of silence. <laughs> um, it's interesting, though. That's, that's pretty profound, isn't it? Especially, you know, Think about that, right? It's like we're in this information age. We have all of these many blessings. Technologically speaking, we communicate around the world. My mother and I and Earl and, and um, his sister Beth were in Israel. We were able to communicate on um, Facebook Messenger, like they were there, and we could FaceTime each other. And, um, and, and we have all these blessings. We have all this stuff at us. 
But we have so much, we spend so much time just immersed in all this knowledge that we, we don't take time to, to sort through it. To say just because we can do it, should we do it? This includes, <laughs> this includes that message I was giving about just a minute ago on laws. Yeah, we have laws, but are they just laws? Are we acting justly? Are we acting Christian? Um, so my wife said to me, hey, Barry, you know what you should do? We should do a 30 days act of kindness. And I thought to myself, well, 30 day act of kindness, what's that? And she's like, um, well, it's where you take 30 days and you do acts of kindness. And I'm like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty profound. I said, and I think to myself, well, well, the only thing is, the only thing is that's kind of going against my message of cruelty and um, my message of cruelty and and um, being the opposite of kindness. But, but then as I was continuing reading and, and reflecting, I'm like, no. As long as we are working towards liberating acts of kindness. And so next week I'm going to share with you, not this week, I have um, a printout for us, uh, suggestions on how we can have um, acts of kindness to people. Because I have, a, I have a theory that if we start being a little kinder to each other, that maybe instead of violence leading to violence, leading to more violence, that maybe these little acts of liberating kindness may liberate someone else and maybe liberate someone else and maybe have a snowball effect in the other direction so that we can reclaim God's creation as something that is good. So one of the acts of kindness, and this is the, work, this is the only one I want to give you for this week to work on, uh, <clears throat> is well, well, the one Mr. Rogers said, is spend a little time in silence thinking about things that you're sure about. Take something that you are sure about, very convicted about, very passionate about when it comes to something politically in our lives, right? Something in the news. And ask yourself, what's if I'm wrong? And I know everybody's thinking, oh yeah, that'd be good if this person did that or, this, or that person do that. No, I'm asking me to do that. Would you do that? And the act of kindness is the message that we can't give something we don't have. So the first act of kindness is, would you be kind to yourself? Would you take a moment to be in love with yourself as a beloved child of God? I can't love you if I don't recognize that God loves me, can I? I can be nice to you. I can be you know, kind to you, but that's not liberation, is it? This is preparation for you. Pray for yourself this week. Forgive yourself this week. Recognize that as daunting as the issues that are in front of us today, that they are so small in comparison when you're yoked with the creator of the universe that created the entire universe to set the stage to love you. To love us. God doesn't do things in vain. God does things magnificently and wonderfully made and called us to be part of this. Amen?